Welcome, everyone, to episode two of the Run Flat podcast. I am one half of the dynamic duo here, Matt Feldick, joined by my good friend, Skylar Hall. Skylar, how are you doing, buddy? I'm good, man. I'm good. It was a uh, busy weekend. A lot happening on the sports front, both inside and outside of running. And just just vibing, baby. Vibe. That song is just such a slapper. You just can't, can't be mad when you got that intro track. Dude, I know. I know. A great weekend for sports in general. I feel pretty good about myself for having uh, been texting you track and field stuff all weekend while I knew you were at the 49ers game. So uh, you're welcome. Uh, just trying to keep you on your toes. But yeah, big a big weekend of events in the running space today. We're going to we're going to touch on all aspects of the flat world. Uh, we're going to have you know, some road running news. We're going to have some cross country news. We're going to have some indoor track. We're going to hit it all. Uh, and yeah, I'm, I'm super excited to, uh, to be here for episode two and none of this would, uh, would be possible without the support of, uh, our good friends at the Tucson marathon and Aravipa event, um, Tucson marathon. If you're looking for a December road marathon, it's a long ways away, but there's no better place to be than, uh, Arizona in the winter. So Tucson Marathon registration just opened. So go and check that out at TucsonMarathon.com. Huge shout out to them and Jamil, uh, owner of Aravipa Race Director, for giving us two schmucks a platform to to talk uh, all road running, track running type stuff. So without uh, without uh, wasting any more time, let's go ahead and dive right into what we're dubbing our weekly rundown, our five major topics in the sport. Topic number one, let's not bury the lead here, Skyler. Emily Sisson, new U.S. half marathon record at Houston. I feel like we we saw it coming, uh, just given mm-hmm. kind of where her fitness was and what her goals were coming in. Houston is uh, an Emily Sisson course. She's, you know, had success there. I believe set the U.S. half record there last year. Mm-hmm. Um so yeah, what are what are your thoughts on uh, on Emily being the first U.S. woman to go under an hour seven for the half uh, there at Houston? Which is wild. It's just wild to think about. Um, I mean, we we touched on it last last show about we've seen American women just making these leaps and bounds in the like international context, but to to see her you know get into the sixty six is just was was wild to see and like it was a well run performance it, it wasn't anything that was too crazy no go out super hard and rig um even though she only took second in the race and and first was off the the front by a little gap there relatively early on ran well within herself and you know this has just been the last like 370 days of Emily Sisson, right? Like great half performance last year, comes through in Chicago, sets the American record. She split under 69.30 in Chicago. So it's like on paper, insane. on paper, you're like, all right, this should definitely be uh, in the cards here at Houston. But to, to see it happen uh, in such sort of uh, dominating fashion, I mean, that's that, that's a huge chunk of time to take off of uh of a, what was already a fairly stout record uh, in, in that American record. We've only seen so many women go under uh, really 68. And for her to be like, nah, hold on. I'm just going to like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take my own record and make it like 30 seconds more uh, difficult to achieve. It's just, she's so far and uh, far and away better than even the best American marathoners at that half distance. And it's not because she has this crazy road or excuse me, this crazy track speed. Um, she's shown it on the, on the marathon side as well, that she's just very, very strong. So really, really putting her line in the sand now to be like, we, we know that Molly got all the hype coming out of Tokyo, but I'm going to be the number one going into next year's trials. Like you, at that, at this point, you have to have to say that. Yeah. Well, and just to touch on that, she doesn't have necessarily like world-class track speed, right? But she's made teams. So it's not like. It's not like she's doesn't she isn't a credential track athlete, right? Like no. that's one of the things that I think is super interesting about um, about Emily Sisson is her range, right? Like she's she's been you know qualifying for trials in the five and ten k on the track. She's made teams on the track. She's got the American record in the marathon, 
And how about this for, you know, uh, I mean, geez, less than a 12 month stretch, like a nine month stretch here. So she set the American record at the half in Indy in May of 2022. So I don't mm-hmm. think it was, it wasn't in Houston. So 67, 11 in Indy in May follows it up in the fall with the American record in the full follows it up in January with breaking her own record uh, in the half uh, at Houston. Like that, that's a pretty, like that's a pretty top level uh, 12 month stretch for a road, like a road runner, right? Like you might see something like that on the track, but it's hard to put those kind of races together consistently um, on the road. And of note, Emily Sisson is the first American to go sub 67 on a legal course. Kara Goucher did run 66 57 on an aided course uh, back then. So I do want to, I want to give Kara her flowers, Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, I mean, Emily Sisson next level. And for her to finish that high up, that women's field was pretty loaded uh, as well. Some really strong runners up at the front. So for her to finish second and then obviously go sub 67 is pretty incredible. Yeah, just completely uh, in terms of the the American bucket, uh, dominating performance over over the rest of the women in the field. And just you you have to be stoked that she's healthy and consistent. Right. We know that she had uh, she had put down some performances going into those Olympic trials in 2020. Obviously, you got the, the DNF and then took the additional two years to come back to the marathon. If she can stay on the street, you know, this really does set up well for uh, for this 2023 and 2024 run, because I I got to imagine we've already seen so many people get announced for for Boston. Uh, and then obviously London's going to be kind of in, in play for for the marathon majors. We still have to feel the world championship marathon team. Right. It's not here in the U.S., so it's not going to be as, as sexy as uh, as it was last year in Eugene for a lot of the American athletes. But we still need to put some people on the line. And I'll be very interested to see if if that's an avenue that she wants to go sort of get her feet wet uh, at that level of competition before oh, basically a trial run uh, for what the Olympic uh, year would look like. Um, or, you know, we're going to see some of some of the recent heavy hitters uh, coming back. Your your Sarah Hall, your Kira D'Amato. Um, you know, we'll, it'll be interesting to see how this mid-year marathon uh, that's sort of between the the fall or excuse me, the spring and fall uh, cycles, how that's going to come in, into play and really springboard uh, a couple of folks into Orlando next year. Yeah, I mean, it's going to be super exciting to see what she does. Obviously, would love to see her. Um, you know, make the journey to Budapest. Yeah. Um, for worlds, you know, I'd love to see those races continue to become staples on the calendar. Uh, right. Like, and especially for someone like Emily, where, you know, the DNF at the trials, um, you know, that probably didn't leave a great taste in her mouth to just get her feet wet in that type of racing environment, I think would be good. We all know she can run fast, obviously. Uh, right. But getting to see how she, how she handles kind of that championship style racing on the roads would be pretty uh, interesting to see. Obviously, Emily wasn't the only person who, uh, who ran at Houston, number of other uh, notable performances. And so before I send it to you for some of your uh, more notable performances, Skylar, gotta love Jenny Simpson coming out, crushing yeah. it in her half marathon debut, an hour 10 and change without looking it up. Um, really strong run. I think that that was also probably expected, right? Maybe not an hour 10, but like we expected her to, to get a qualifier at the half distance, right? Like now what she does with that qualifier will be probably the more interesting thing to keep our eye on over the next, you know, 12, 15 months. Right. Because, um, yeah, I mean, it would be super exciting to, you know, see what she can do, but that's a, that's a pretty massive, jump and distance even just moving up to the half is a pretty a pretty big jump but it'll be interesting to see kind of what she does with that half time in terms of being a qualifier for the trials who else uh stood out to you at houston whether it be in the half or uh in the full field uh yeah on the women's side there were a couple folks that that popped out in in that half marathon uh i mean i'm sure we'll talk about molly huddle but but you know you got to be stoked for 
for her coming in just a just a second over 70 minutes flat and you know really setting herself up well uh, good good to see that she is running healthy we can dig into that because i know i'm sure that you have thoughts on molly um and then a couple a couple other folks erica kemp not somebody i was particularly like it wasn't top of mind but she's one of those runners that you just see everywhere right she's always at, at different either like usatf championships or she's on the grand prix and she's she's debuting in, in the marathon in boston so to see her come out, run, you know, 70, uh, 70, 14, I think. So like not particularly that far behind Molly Huddle, I think was one or two spots behind Jenny Simpson or maybe just one or two spots ahead. You know, that that she's going to be one to watch. Uh, she's a gamer when it comes down, when it comes down to it, she's going to be a gamer. Uh, and then you put it in Boston, which is a, you know, it's a very different course than Houston, right? It is not a time trial. So uh, so it'll be very interesting to see what she does. But I, I think this this is a performance that she is happy with coming out of Houston. And then somebody I honestly completely missed going into it, Nessa Frazier. Recently left BTC. Uh, you know, she's, I believe, back in the Bay Area because uh, she is a Stanford grad. And I think she's coming back and, and doing some things uh, in addition to in addition to running, but she comes out and runs like a 71 flat in, in the half as a 5k, 10k specialist. You know, she's got some indoor titles, uh, and at the NCAA level, but has not really accomplished much, uh, of anything of note on the roads and cross, uh, sort of post collegially. So you see her come out, uh, mess around and get a, get, <laughs> run a 71. You're like, okay, maybe, maybe there's some, there's some long range here, uh, that, that many years in the BTC system might have just like developed a certain aerobic capacity that's going to really lend itself uh, to to strong performances yeah. on the road. So super excited for her and, you know, and and this new mindset, it's a new year, it's a whole new training regime. And for her to come out and do this, it, it, the world is kind of her oyster uh, for this 2023 season. Yeah, well, and I think that sometimes just like a, a change up is all you need, right? Like, Sometimes you just need, uh, you know, a, a change of scenery to kind of get you excited about training, especially at this level again, right? Like she's probably been training at a high level since middle school or high school year round, probably for a good majority of that um, without a ton of, of like prolonged breaks. And so sometimes it's, it's hard, right? Like, you know, this, like sometimes it's hard to want to get out and go through like that grindy workout that you know you need to do uh when you've just been like you've been doing that for you know a number of years right and so i think sometimes a change of pace you know it can do an athlete a lot of good and and i think that her flying under the radar isn't you know a disservice to her or like her accomplishments or her resume i think it actually speaks to like how good this field was right to where it's like you've got these high high level athletes that kind of flew under the radar and to touch on that, like Wesley Kiptu, you know, a Kenyan, Kenyan athlete who runs and trains here in Flagstaff with NAZ Elite. But for him to, you know, be right up there, I mean, he nearly won the race. It was the closest finish you could possibly have, right? Um, and then, I mean, that's just amongst a number of a number of other athletes. And I know, like, we only have so much time each week when we do this, so we couldn't touch on every athlete in the field. But, you know, Parker Stinson, kind of another one who I don't know that he like really ever flies under the radar, but kind of like we didn't talk much about him. He ran 2.12.11, Tyler Pinnell, fifth in the marathon, 2.12.16. Like the American men ran pretty well. The times weren't as fast maybe uh, as we'd expected, but I think there were a number of uh, really strong performances. And another one to mention before we uh, keep keep the show on the road is uh Hitomi Nia Japanese uh Japanese runner who was trying to chase the full standard she just went out and absolutely crushed everyone yeah um, she was number one on the entrance list coming in Japanese distance running is very highly underrated uh in terms of like how good it is and she just went out and just she time trialed by herself basically she had a uh a pacer who I assumed is a coach or a training partner, uh, mm -hmm. something like that. Another Japanese male athlete who 
was in the race or maybe was just a designated pacer, but she had a, a really great run there as well. Um, anyone else that kind of stood out to you or any other kind of parting wisdom on, uh, on Houston broadcast was also pretty uh, solid. I'll say that. It was, yes, they, they came a long way in, in the one year, uh, since we, we dunked on them and we mentioned it last week. So, so, so stoked, uh, that they stepped their game up, uh, just three quick thoughts on, on the men's side. One, uh, yeah. Wesley Kibb too, without gloves. You see that? This is the first time I've ever seen him race without gloves. Uh, here's the Love thing. It. If he's wearing gloves, he probably would have won. Um, <laughs> he definitely, you remember the video from like the Turkey trots last year where homeboy was like racing for like third or fourth place and like deck dude into the, into the barricades. It got yeah. kind of close to that. I, I was like, are we going to have like, another one of these? Incidents? It was like the professional version of that, right? Where it's yeah. like, ah, it looked like it might happen, but then they both knew like, ah, can't do that. You know? Right. Right. But Hey, I mean, that's, <laughs> that's next level racing, right? It's uh, you're thinking like, okay, it's, it's how many times have we seen road marathons happen where like, just, you know, in our backyards, you know, you just had uh, you know, you've got Tucson marathon. We just had uh, another one in Phoenix this week where people just like fail to run tangents. It was like, age, we're just like, yo, I'm just, there's a line on the road. So I'm just going to run on this line. It's like, that's not the tangent though. You're running extra. Wesley was just like shoulder check, most direct line shoulder check most direct it was it was brilliant to watch so um so that bodes well for him especially you know this is uh this is sort of like the the this should be his come out his breaking out year right we saw in college he raced one type of way the entire time it worked well early on and people caught up to his game um and then he didn't have the success towards the the end of his collegiate career now that he's sort of acclimated into altitude into the NAZ elite crew. Uh, this is, this is a good kickoff to the 2023 campaign. Uh, always difficult to make a world team <laughs> when, when you're representing Kenya, but uh, there's some, there's some opportunity for him there for sure. Uh, in terms of the American men, I was a little let down, uh, mostly on the half marathon side, uh, the marathon, it is what it is. Like Parker Stinson is always going to be kind of there <laughs> just like, He's like, you see him show up in a YouTube video and then you forget that he exists. And all of a sudden he's on start line. You're like, all right, he's good for a top 10. But, um, but on the half marathon side, it just wasn't as fast as I was anticipating. We only had two guys drop under the, the Olympic trials qualifier. One of which is Connor Mance, who has the number one marathon time, uh, at last year for, for Americans. And then Frank Laura hit it exactly on the nose. So I was expecting one, maybe two more guys to flirt under, uh, sort of flirt under that 63 and Colin Benny. I got questions. I have questions about Colin because he ran what 209 30 at the marathon project back in 2020, uh, made the, I think he made the world team, uh, or he was slated to make the world team, uh, based off of the descending order list last year in the marathon and then comes out and runs. What, what did he, he ran what, like 63, 10, 63, something like that. Maybe it's like 62 high. Um, like it's, he doesn't have a great half marathon PR for a guy who's run 60 or excuse me, run 209. So I'm always, maybe he just not have the leg speed, but I was hoping that he would be, he, he would be closer to the front, right? You can't be a 209 guy, basically have one of the top seven times in the last four years in America. And then get rolled to be like the fifth American in a half marathon. That's not even like a U.S. championship, you know? So I just, I'm hoping to see a little bit more from him coming, coming forward, just because I, I, we need more depth. We need to have, we need to have more folks definitely under 210, hopefully under 208. And if we have one of those guys sort of like falling by the wayside, it's just, uh, it's not where I want to see American marathoning and half marathoning going. So yeah, I mean, I'm with you. I think that <clears throat> I think that it was a bit disappointing uh, to more men get under that half standard. It's it's also hard, right? Because the half standard used to be 104, I think, for the 2020 trials. Um, so now it's down at 103. Um, so I think you're seeing, you know, people who are giving it their first crack, maybe falling in that kind of. Uh, that window in between uh, kind of the old standard and the new standard, right? Um, mm. Yeah, I mean, I'm Colin Benny was one that st stuck out 
Shad Kipchurcher, obviously another one to me and you, he's a, uh, he's someone that we kind of uh, grew up with, right. When he was running at Oklahoma state back in their mm-hmm. heyday, um, might've cost them a national title in cross country one year, but I don't want to speculate. Uh, but he like such an incredible runner and such an incredible career. Um, <clears throat> and for these guys to just come up a little short, you know, Colin Benny, 10 seconds short, Shad Kipchurcher, uh, 25 seconds short. Um, so close. So I think that we'll see more uh, people come through, but the depth uh, of kind of where we expected this race to be um, just wasn't super great. Right. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. I, it, you know, there's, there's time, right. There's, there's with the half marathon, it's a little easier to come back, run something in, you know, April, run something in June. Like you have a few more, more cracks at it, but it, it, this is not the, the steady forward progression that we would anticipate, yep. right? If individual athletes, we don't expect a linear progression, right? We all know this, but for, as a whole, as a unit, if somebody falls back, you expect somebody else to step up and just didn't quite see it this weekend. Hopefully this is, this is the anomaly, not, not the new, mm. the new norm. So but, wait, did we get, th- I think we got three people qualified. Ryan, fact check me live. Oh no, a couple. Yeah. Well, I think that you thought maybe the standard was 102 and it's 103. So we got we also got the women's center 72. So yeah. Uh, we got we got Brian Schrader. I want to give these people a shout out who also made it after we just dunked on it on everyone. Brian Schrader, NAU alum, I believe, right? Uh um, sounds right. He he qualified a wet bar- Baraki uh from Alamosa, Colorado, also qualified. So Two more in, but again, still not. Oh, oh, and Ed Cheserek, but he's listed as he's Kenyan born, so I you don't know what will happen with him. Yeah, he doesn't yeah, have U.S. Still, citizenship, still right? No, he does not. Yeah, cool, cool. Uh, what else? Anything else uh, worth noting aside from U.S. men's marathoning not having or half marathoning not having uh, the best performance, like you said plenty of half marathons out there that are good as well and you can come back so it'll be interesting to see maybe who's looking at indy mini in uh Mm -hmm. in uh, may that's a super fast course um some of these guys i imagine will be looking for towards like grandmas and full marathons kind of mid-year um yep so it'll be interesting to see how that plays out but hopefully we can uh we we can uh get get some more people down there you know Let's go. Do better. That's all we're asking. Not not that either of us on this are going to be running the standard anytime soon, but but just for, for the sake of for the sake of growing the sport, let's let's get some some names and some faces uh, that folks can get behind. Yep, love it. And so switching gears a little bit from the road space over to the grass fields, uh, the cross country courses. Australian cross country champs. I know that while this was happening, I believe you were literally at the 49ers game. Uh, And so I'm sitting here watching, like texting you stuff while you're trying to watch uh, Brock Purdy just do damage uh, on the Seahawks. But um, obviously notice the flag in the background. My wife is Australian. So we were following really closely. And this is actually super interesting how Australia does their, kind of qualifying, right? So they had their men's and women's 10K cross-country races, and those, the top three in each of those races qualified to world champs at Bathurst. Um, From there, they also had a 2K race, which was a qualifier. The men's and women's winner was a qualifier for mixed gender relay at world cross champs. And then they also have at-large selections still, right? So there will be additional slots that that they select, but this is different from how they've typically done or this past year, how they've selected Olympic and world teams on the track where it has just been by selection. And we'll talk about that a little bit more when we talk about the 2K races, but men's 10K Open, I don't think that there were any real surprises here aside from maybe the order, but even then, not a whole lot of... Um, uh, of real drama. Uh, Jack Rayner, 
takes the win. Matt Ramsden in, in second, who led uh, most of the race before being caught. And then Brett Robinson, uh, who I believe he and his brother both train in Kenya, correct? Um, Australian right. athlete yeah. trains in Kenya. They were the top three on the men's side who uh, who will be moving forward. And then on the women's side, I'll just give the top three real quick before we start breaking this, this down. Rose Davies, uh, women's champion Liam Pompiani, and Caitlin Adams in second and third. So those six athletes uh, secured their spot uh, to world champs in Bathurst in Australia, which is a pretty big moment for Australian distance running, right? I think that it's slowly been on the come up, but they've had a lot of athletes that have started to kind of age out, right? You know, you've got Genevieve, now Gregson, Ryan Gregson, both of them starting to get more on the twilight side of their careers, um, along with a number of other runners. But it'll be nice to see this next generation coming in. Any uh, any general thoughts on uh, on the results or any of the – I don't know if you would got to go back and watch any of the coverage uh, or anything like this, but this is something I followed closely. But any notes on uh, – on kind of the overall results of the 10 K races there. Yeah. Um, I mean, when you know the criteria going in, it's, it's a lot easier, right? It's just survived in advance. So you take it out. All right, cool. I'm safely in the top three. So even if you rig a little bit, like it's nice to be selection champion. Um, but you just know, as long as I'm on the podium, I'm going, I'm going to worlds. So I think all of it was pretty much according to scratch. Uh, when when you look at the 10Ks in that respect, um, I did appreciate the course for for looking a lot like a golf course, right? Very well manicured. Um, like it had it had some legit hills, right? It's a a 2K looped course, as most championship courses are now, uh, or maybe it was 25, 2500 for them. Yeah, um, it was 2.5K. Um, but yeah, so you basically like you know, created a very spectator friendly situation, but like there was a real climb each one of those loops. And I was like looking at the video coverage. I was like, Oh damn, like that's, that's real. Um, so, so kudos to them for not making it just a track meet uh, before going to worlds and from, from the media side uh, you know, and this also extended over to the 2k, the drone shots, drone shots were clutch uh, because you had the women and the men running at the same time, although staggered uh, for both the 10, the 10k and the 2k. And the fact they had they had picture in picture, you had like an overhead shot of like here's how the women's packs are developing while you have the the lead gator on the men's field and like vice versa. It was awesome. Absolutely just from a ability to follow standpoint was very nice. So shout out to them for doing something that uh, apparently we haven't really been successful at doing uh, for most national uh, national championships, qualifiers, uh, things like that. Yeah, I mean, I thought that that was really good. Obviously, I have maybe my qualms with, uh, like, why are we starting the the women's race right before the men finish? Uh, like, what are we doing there? But the coverage itself was actually pretty incredible, right? Like you said, the drone shot with the, the kind of lead uh, golf cart type cam, that was pretty next level. And the other thing that I appreciate, I know I don't know if this happens to everyone, but I know it's happened to us in the past is, uh, when we try to follow anything that's being streamed to Athletics Australia on YouTube, at a, at one point we were getting like blocked, like it was unavailable in the U.S. So I don't know if that's like a setting thing that they changed in regards to distribution, but I do appreciate them uh, doing whatever they did or YouTube doing whatever it did to allow, uh, you know, Australians living in America and American fans to be able to follow the coverage, because I know that that's something we've struggled with. Uh, here in the past, I thought, yeah, overall the coverage was was really great. I think that it did go pretty much to chalk. Although I will say, Brett Robinson left it a little close there. Uh, only hang, he, I think he was uh, in the clear by three seconds over Rory. Uh, what I don't I don't know his last name. His first name is Rory. He ran at Indiana University. Um, I believe he might have been like a miler in college, uh, or maybe mile three k. Um, but yeah, left it pretty close, only held on by about three seconds, but ultimately doesn't matter. You're still moving on to worlds. And yeah. Then, but you also got to remember though, that worlds is in five weeks, four weeks. And so to double back, you, you don't want to go harder in a 10 K than you have to. 
you Dude, know, it's in five weeks. And then I think that either uh, Ramsden or Rainer, Rory Hunter is his name. Ramsden or Rainer, one of them is planning to run like a half or a full marathon in like Japan. In between. I, that's, a, I, that's a nice long tempo. Yeah, that makes yeah, sense. Yeah, it's great. I love it. You know, and both those guys, obviously, both of them have made uh, Australian national teams either for Worlds or Olympic Games. So super stout runners. And then moving on to a race that I didn't get to follow as closely as I would have wanted to, given, you know, the entrance list because of everything that was going on. Uh, but the 2K, one really interesting concept, right, to, you know, to be able to bring, you know, some of these middle distance people uh, into the fray, but in terms of people who are going to be joining on the mixed relay cross country team at Worlds, Stewie McSween just absolutely dominated the field, uh, running like five. I'm going to pull the results up here real quick. Five ten for two k. That's that's silly. That's silly, and it's not like he was beating uh like scrubs like callum davies is a pretty solid runner himself uh and he beat him by six seconds and then on the lady side abby caldwell continuing her uh redemption tour takes the win out kicking jess hall in the last 400 meters beating lyndon hall georgia griffith was in the race these are all australian olympians um the interesting fact that i know that I had sent this to you before mm -hmm. is Abby Caldwell is someone that like, I will probably root for like until my end of time uh, because she got absolutely hosed by Australia yeah. Athlet athletics, Australia for world champs. She won the Australian championships in the 1500, which in the past that person has always been selected to the team. Um, whether it's been a world champs or an Olympic champs, she was not selected, was passed up for, uh, I believe Georgia Griffith was the person who made it in place of her, but doesn't matter. Didn't make the team. Then comes back, you know, after world champs, bronze medal at the Commonwealth Games, dusts all the other Australian women, most of who were doubling back from world champs. So keep that in mind. But super awesome to see her just continuing to have uh, great success here now uh, on the 2K cross country course. But yeah, I mean, Australia Athletics should change their rules because of that mistake. I mean, it probably did factor a little bit into how this world selection went down, um, or at least for for cross. And it's the, the the relay is super entertaining. So if you go back and watch Euros, right, we also see uh, the, that four by two mixed relay happen there. Strategy is crazy. Because you can basically run in any order. Do you want to go girl, girl, guy, 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 girl, guy, girl, whatever. Like you can mix and match as, as you see fit. You just got to cover the distance. And to know that you have like basically two of your top two athletes in the 1500, both like not just running well at this time of year, which is a very weird time to be running fast if you're a track athlete, but to want to run cross. Right. It's not something we get to see often because um, this is outside of their wheelhouse. There's probably not a lot of uh, like contract bonuses for for running this mixed relay. But they were there. They were throwing it down. Um, you know, Stewie obviously had a very good like holiday break there, like him and and, and Ollie Hoare uh, going around doing those. That, I don't even know what you call them. Not like not elimination miles, but the handicap miles, which are also very entertaining to, to, to Dude, watch. Can we bring um, those to also the one of those on grass. We need to Dude, I'd be those. so down. We have. To. I'd be so down. There, we have way too much information on folks as Stravas that we could handicap that pretty well, and then probably uh, probably make it happen. But yeah, you need you need some some variation. It can't just be all all weather tracks. Like we got to get some dirt tracks in there. We got to get some some golf course loops. Something. We'll we'll keep it entertaining. But but yes. The, the, so we knew Stewie was strong. Uh, he ran what like four oh one. Or like he was running like mid fours or mid four aughts um, in December, then comes here, does it again. And then, you know, is is committed to representing his country in a home world that they've been waiting for four additional years to have or something. Uh, you know, it's super, super good on him uh, to, to do that. And now we, we wait and see how uh, 
the the selection for the second member uh, for both the men and the women go for that that relay. But their relay is going to be pretty stacked because you have obviously the the rest of the field that was in both of those two Ks, right? If Jess Hole is your backup uh, on the women's side, like you're doing okay. Um, and then and then Ollie Ollie Hoare, uh of On Athletics Club, uh, based out of Boulder, Colorado, his already put in uh, a waiver uh, because he wasn't going to be able to make it back for this selection race. Um, but, but they granted him uh, the opportunity to apply for the team. And so he will go up um, hit by resume against the likes of everyone else in that 2K. And they're going to figure out who is going to best represent Australia uh, at home. And if Ollie is your best, is, is your second option, that's dirty. Like that is a completely like a dude who did who who came out of the NCAA system and like had some pretty decent success uh, over grass and obviously Com Games champ. Uh, dude, Stewie yeah, McSwain, you know, Australia, Ollie you know. Hoare, Abby Caldwell, and Jessica Hull. That line is pretty amazing. And they're leaving off like Lyndon Hall, who uh, has made you know, world champs and Olympic teams and has made like rounds. I don't know if she's been in the finals, but I know that she's made it through some of the rounds. Like, yeah, that's pretty dirty. I'm, I'm super excited for him. Um, you know, and, and summertime cross country in itself is just kind of weird. Like in my head, it's difficult to wrap my head around. Um, and remember, it's just coming from a child of California where, even the fall is still pretty sunny and dry. Um, but, but yeah, to have folks go down there uh, is going to be super interesting. And, and the issue is, you know, we've heard so many folks, especially those who are trying to qualify for track world championships, basically say they have no interest in going to worlds. So it's just refreshing uh, to see folks who, I mean, for those who are based in Australia, that travel is significantly easier than having to fly intercontinental. But um, but just for folks of that caliber to be able to say, yeah, even though I'm trying to be, uh, you know, on this world team in six months, I'm willing to, you know, miss a couple races where I could get some ranking points, uh, potentially help my standard and just like go do, you know, two to 10 K and have some fun, uh, and, and still get to wear my country's kit. That's, that's good. I'm, I'm super excited. Cause that's not what we're seeing. Uh, we're not, not terribly what we're seeing in the Euro side, definitely not what we're hearing about uh, at the U.S. side as well. Yeah, for sure. And I think that segues, segues us in perfectly to kind of our, what what should we dub this, our way too early uh, U.S. cross-country champs preview. Uh, it's not way too early. The race is in like four days. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, it is. You're right. You're right. Sorry, I was thinking of, <laughs> I was thinking of Worlds. Uh, oh, don't get me wrong. If U.S. championships was an additional four weeks away, that would make my chances still horrible. Right. But I would be at least You're, a little bit better. It's this weekend. But yeah. No kidding. I'm an idiot. Um, women's field, <laughs> kind of Wayne Kalati versus the world. Sky, uh, Skyler headlines the men's field, I think, uh, on the open 10K side. No. So, no, but the women's field, there are, while it is kind of – Weenie's race to lose. I would say there are some pretty stout athletes. Steph Bruce, who decided not to retire, is uh, mm -hmm. is in the race. Um, you've got Emily Durgan from Adidas who's running. You've got uh, Emily Lapari, um, a number of other uh, Laura Thweet, who uh, is an absolute you know machine, incredible athlete. Who stands out to you aside from uh, Wayne as uh, Ali O also on the start list? I don't know how I skipped over that, but yeah. what uh, what what uh, excites you the most on the women's side here? So uh, Wayne finished second at nationals last year behind Alicia Monson. Uh, it was non it was a non-selection year. We didn't have worlds. Uh, it was just a good old battle down in San Diego. She comes back. Obviously, she's always on a tear in the fall. Um, always when she's she's dominated that 5K uh, in New York, the the U.S. Championships, two years in a row. And so, it, it this is really her race to lose. Um, you know, obviously, very storied career in cross country back in college at New Mexico. So, so just if she loses 
then that's already automatically the shocker of the weekend. Um, you mentioned uh, Emily Durgan, very solid, uh, has a, a new 10K PR from last year, uh, 3133. So she's got some newfound fitness. Um, she also ran 67 high at Houston last year. So as we were just talking about uh, some of the performances on the women's side, she's got that strength uh, and, and that should bode well uh, on what is a pretty flat course in uh, in Mechanicsville, Virginia. Um, some other folks that I'm actually very interested to see how, how this shakes out, though. You mentioned Laura Thweet. She's getting ready for Boston, so I don't know what the hell she's doing here, but I'm here for it. Um, so just, just absolutely absurd. But uh, Carrie Verdon of uh, Lee Troops uh, group out in Boulder, uh, she ran a... 231 marathon last year in Chicago, if I remember that correctly. And she was top 10 at championships last year for, for cross. So also uh, got, got some racing shops. Uh, Katie Izzo, the former Razorback, uh, she was third at NCAAs in 2019. Uh, haven't seen her run cross since, I don't believe. So this, this could really bode to her strengths. Uh, Michaela Reinhardt, uh, the railroad athletics, uh, I guess, leader uh, on the women's side. Uh, she was 11th at cross champs just last month uh, and on that wild course, which is uh, was not kind. So to have something that's just flat and you're not hopping hay bales uh, should go pretty well for her. And then Edna Kurgat, third at cross champs in that same race and uh, was sixth at the U.S. 10 mile championships last year clearly has the range has the speed so um selection on the u.s side very different than the australians because it is top six eligible folks you're in and there's two alternates you'll be named an alternate but you don't, you don't actually get to travel but as i mentioned a lot of people are there they might run this championship and then choose not to go because they have to run milrose games or some indoor meter they're, they're chasing points and they don't want to travel all the way around uh, to the other side of the globe so it's going to be interesting to see how far this rolls down. Uh, and then you still have to be in the top 15. So for whatever reason, we don't find six women uh, and men uh, for that matter uh, in the top 15. Then it goes to who else was in this race on Saturday that hit a world standard last year. And it's, it's, and then, it, and then it, we still don't fill it for some reason. Then it just goes to like resume and people who apply. So it is, it's going to be interesting. The race itself will be spectacular. And then it's a function of do we send, are we sending our top six or is it going to be uh, sort of a weird roll down from there? But women's race is going to be waning off the front and then just a, just some legitimately grueling cross country battles uh, for those two through six spots. Yeah, no, it's going to be <clears throat> the women's race. I think like you pointed out is going to be, Really fun to watch, but maybe not for the win, although crazier things in the sport have, have happened, certainly, right? But I think the the opposite of that is true on the men's side in a lot of ways, where I don't there, there are probably people who are favorites, but I look at this list and I'm like, man, there's probably a dozen people here who have a have a chance to to win it. You've got Emmanuel and Hillary Bohr. You've got uh, Sam Chalanga is is back and running well. You've got um, Skylar Hall, obviously. No, um, Eric Jenkins. Like I scroll through this list, and Lenny Career is on there, and I know that I'm like skipping Bernard Keeter. He was the one that I was looking for. He sticks out to me uh, as someone who's just like interesting to watch, right? Because he's made you know finals on the track and the steeple. Um, incredible incredible athlete incredibly fast but to see him uh back uh on the cross country course going to be really interesting to watch but there's a number of people here who uh who I think really have a shot at, at winning and then to you know go to the top 6 that could be you know 20 people have a chance at getting the top 6 just depending on how the day shakes out so who are uh who are kind of the notables for you uh or who who do you think are kind of the ones to watch yeah, yeah. Uh, we got an email, I think, over the weekend that was like, hey, if you 
are interested in going the world team, you have to like submit your information for the visa and whatever ahead of time. Uh, and I was like, I'm not even going to fill out this form because I was like, if, if 15 people start, if only 15 people start this race, that's my chance to sneak onto a world team. But clearly there are more than 15 people who can win this race as long as they show up. And I'm like, all right, well, clearly this ain't, th this isn't my pathway into a team USA Jersey, but I'll, I'll be out there. Um, <laughs> just watching them blow <laughs> fast because that's what happens. Is this, um, before you get into whatever, it, is this hey, a 2K remember, loop or 2.5K loop? Okay. 2K loop. Um, but it's it's USATF, so it's always a little bit long because they have to factor in like an 80 meter run off of the end of it to make sure it's not a short course. I don't know why that's a thing in cross. It's really not that important. Um, really, really smashed my hopes and dreams last year at championship because I was like, oh, I'm a I'm a PR in the 10K. And I was like, this is a 6.5 mile race for no reason. Um, so yeah, that's likely to happen again. But but it's flat, and we'll see what happens. Um, other people to watch. Okay, so from last year's cross country championships, the two through six place runners are all coming back this year. Uh, none of which were me. So um, you've got uh, last year's runner up was Dylan Maggard. All right, you forget the Utah boy uh, had a pretty solid season on the track as well. Uh, was really chasing standards. And I saw uh, his name as I was scrolling here right after I I turned it over to you. So good catch. Yeah, so he was runner-up last year. Uh, you had Sam Chalenga was third at this race last year. Lenny Carrera was fourth. Uh, Bernard Keeter was fifth. And then uh, Ben Eidenschenk was sixth. Um, both Sam and Ben were at Cross Champs uh, back in December in Austin. They had pretty pretty solid races, all things considered. So so I think that they're in shape. Uh, and then you mentioned uh, Hillary and Emmanuel Bohr. Uh, both showing up it's gonna be it's gonna be pretty insane uh but then you also have Carabella Rasa who was fourth at Worlds in Cross in 2019 like dude knows what he's doing to make, not only make a team but then like do well at an Worlds. incredible talent he was on the Atlanta track club when I was still uh living in Atlanta just an absolutely incredible yeah. run I re a runner I remember following him back at uh Oklahoma State as well just like dumb dumb talent level right like talent level is next level uh and so interesting to see uh yeah it'll be interesting to see where his fitness is at he hasn't raced i don't think uh in a little bit like nothing this kind of winter uh time frame so yeah he ran third or he ran cross champs he took 30th oh did he um, oh yeah so so not great, but uh, he also just didn't run well after probably like February or March of 2022. So, so I think he might have been coming back from injury. It was his first real thing. Again, cross champs was not a race you went to to run fast. Uh, it just it it was ruddy and whatever. I, sure, I got lapped three miles in, but it's fine. Anyway, um, we ain't, we ain't got we don't have to, to go off that. Listen, you you brought up Oklahoma State. Let's talk about Isai Rodriguez. All right. Still in college, still has eligibility. And he's like, you know, what? I'm gonna come down to Virginia and, and see what I can do. He was eighth at nationals in cross just in November. Uh, he's, he was fourth at nationals in like 2019, 2018, like, you know, earlier in his collegiate career. So does well in cross races. So to see him show up a guy who's got some fitness has already run uh, like a 13, 20, some, some odd, 5k so he's got some indoor like ncaa standards already like check check that box so to see him come through i'll be interested to see how how he makes this happen um and then bia sambasa if you've been hanging around arizona you've seen him running around uh you know he he won the usatf road grand prix he's just he, he's deceptively fast like when you see him run you're like all right like he's just cruising then you're like he just ran a 60 30 half marathon and he just looked looked relaxed the whole time so so i'm i'm excited to see him and then jared ward just because because i i'm just i, I just want to know what he does it, it makes it'll be nice to know i'm not the oldest person in the race <laughs> i guess um but but yeah no he's gonna show down so again there's like you know you got joey barry atua who just from from an entertaining standpoint like he could do something he could pop off 
10 man elite are always like kind of gritty when it comes to cross. So yeah, dude, I don't know. It's good. The men's race is going to be insane. I might just drop out so I can watch it and just like, I'm like, Oh yeah, I got, I got lapped by Hillary Bohr. Who'd, who'd have guessed it. Uh, and then I just like stand there and watch the rest of it. So, so yeah, super excited to see what happens on this men's side. And then same thing, who, who's actually going to take their, uh, their ticket uh, to Australia for worlds. Just, it's a mess. It's a messy year, but I'm excited about it. Yeah, no, it's going to be super exciting to uh, to watch. Do you know, I know that because you're racing, you've probably been really in the know in terms of the information. Is this going to be streamed anywhere for uh, for view, our viewing audience? I want to say it's on Runner Space. That's usually how it goes down. Um, and it's usually like just the lead gator. So if you're lucky, you'll get like 30 seconds of me as like the first person you see while the pack is catching me until they overtake me. Cause that's what happened last year in San Diego. And I was like, great, 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 great. So, um, Oh, you know what? Sorry. We got to go back to the Australian thing real quick. This, this, you said something that reminded me about like having the women's race staggered at cross champs. I literally went up to both the race director and the gator and was like, listen, if you need to start the women's race on time and I'm not through and there's a high chance that I will not be through because the finish like curled over in front of the start line. I was like, just start the women's race. I'll stand on the side of the track until they're clear. Like it's not gonna be a big deal. So it's, I, I totally respect them like starting the women's race. Just like, Hey, let's just make sure this one section is clear and then go. Like I totally respect that. Um, I don't think we'll run into it this weekend because the men's race is last, but, uh, but yeah, I, so running staggered races, it, it works sometimes, <laughs> unless you have some random dude who paid his entry fee like me out there. So it made me think. Of, oh, but but going back to to USA's, have you looked at the U twenty uh, list? I have the uh, the junior women's uh, list pulled up right now. Yeah, I'm not gonna say, I'm not gonna act like I know a lot of the w- women uh, in the U twenty race, but on the men's side, did you go all the way to the bottom of that start list. Because you know it's in alphabetical order. Oh wow! And you'll notice at the very bottom, you got two people with the last name Young. That's pretty awesome. Yeah, that'll be exciting. Lex and Leo actually signed up for the U twenty race um, against a bunch of collegiates, basically. So very interested to see how that shakes out. Yeah, I'm again. I'm not gonna act like I'm super familiar with. Uh, most of these U20 athletes, but seeing some of their universities uh, gets me excited to to follow along, right? Like you don't end up um, at a lot of these universities without a certain talent level, right? And so both on the men's and women's side, you know, seeing, uh, seeing athletes from uh, some of these major interviews, uh, Oklahoma State, Iowa State, Alabama, like some of these big universities, um, Super exciting to follow along. Super excited to see how uh, Lex and um, Lex and Leo stack up there as well. Just so happy they're not in the same race as me. So yeah, cool. It's gonna be exciting. <laughs> love it, love it. All right. Well, we said that we would have all facets of the flat space covered uh, on this week. So we're gonna go ahead. We'll take. Uh, we'll kind of do like a rapid fire rundown of uh, week one indoors, and then take a look at kind of. The races to watch this weekend. I'm excited that track is back. I hope that you're excited. I was sending you photos of, uh, you know, me taking my kids to uh, to the NAU indoor meet. There's another indoor meet here uh, at the Dome again this weekend, so I'm sure we'll be back. Um, but let's kick it off. UW preview. Biggest thing, well, going in, the thing that I was most excited for was Centerwitz's debut. Mm-hmm. Um, that, I don't know that that maybe. Uh, lived up to the excitement level, but what did what did was the University of Stanford's uh, men's milers. They they went three fifty five, three fifty six, three fifty seven in the men's mile. What on earth is going on with college athletics right now, man? Like, what these kids are running three fifty five, three fifty six, three fifty seven in January? Uh, what what on earth in January? having all ran cross through nationals. Exactly. Exactly. So it doesn't make sense. 10 K training and 1500 training or mile training are not exactly the same. So the fact that they're already balling out is absurd. Um, What's going on. They've got people who can actually push them. 
And that's what it takes. You, you know, this year you're going to need to run that fast to make nationals. Like yeah, I mean, is like, 357 going to get you in? I, I might not. That's probably going to be close. Like, that's what's crazy, dude. Like, it's nice to have it out the way early so you can you can sort of like chill until you get to NPSF, I guess, whatever the West Coast non-Pac-12 race is because we don't believe in indoor in California. But it's going to be very, very, very close for, for 357. But the fact they're doing it in January, um, it, it's nice. Because it also means you can also down cycle and, and kind of like relax because you also on the outdoor side have to regroup and get ready to go until June assuming you don't try to make your your country's world championships team which then takes you into July August, August. Yeah. and then and then you're like all right cool now we got to come back for cross starting in October so yeah it can be a very long season so it's it's good on them for for getting it out the way so quickly and just like in dominating fashion but you know people are going to chase it net we've seen we've seen the entire game rise uh in in the middle distance because well, part of it's shoes, but part of it's like, hey, if you know, we got 17 other guys running 358, why can't I? And so folks are really like gunning for it. It's not just, hey, breaking four is cool nowadays. Um, they're they're really getting after it. So Stanford is is Stanford actually gonna try to win a title on almost all distance and then like a few I'm here bit? for it. I'm here for it. Dude, good times, good times, good on them. I respect it. And then, like we touched on, Matt Centrowitz making his debut. Uh, had a decent 1,000 race. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I guess that's probably where I would leave it. I don't think it was, like, earth-shattering. It wasn't a standard Matt Centrowitz run, but it's his first race in quite some time. So I think the 1K went pretty well, pulled out of the mile. So he was, I think, hoping to double mm -hmm. back, but... You know, I think I'm just happy that he's back racing, I guess, is kind of where I'm at with uh, with uh, Centrowitz. What do you how are you feeling? Yeah, I mean, he's never particularly flashy. We know going into that Olympic trial cycle, he was like unheard from. And then uh, and then just all of a sudden balled out and you're like, OK, like Central, I guess, is kind of back. So he, he's just streaky like that. But now we're also talking about he's in a different headspace than he was pre-injury, different dating scene, different coaching scheme. It kind of feels like. Well, it's, and he's won it, right? Like he's done it. Yeah. He's done it. What like if Matt Centrowitz decided today that he wanted to step away from track and field as an athlete, he's accomplished what you dream of since you're like yeah. a little kid, right? Like. I'm sure when he was an eighth grader or a seventh grader, he was like, I want to win an Olympic gold medal because when you're that young, you don't know any better. Right. And then to right. like go on and accomplish everything he did. Like, I think that that's, yeah. I mean, I obviously am, am glad that Matt Centrowitz is, is still running. I think that he's like an exciting athlete to watch race, especially when he's healthy and fit. So I'm not suggesting like, Oh, he should hang it up or this or that. But like, if he just decided today, like, hey, I don't want to do this anymore, like, tip of my cap to him for everything he's he's done, you know, including being yeah. gifted an NCAA fifteen hundred meter meter title outdoors. But 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 he wants to go out on his own terms, right? I think if the if the injury would have been the end of his career, he would have been pissed. He's too much of a. Uh, I was going to say ego driven, but you kind of can't be a professional without being ego driven. He's too much of like a, like my way is the best way always type guy uh, for, for him to, to go out like that. So I think he, listen, if, if this is just him trying to get back for a farewell tour, then good on him because go out on your own terms, tell your own story and you know, go be, and who knows, maybe there's a the person that we all, maybe there's be. more left in the tank, you know, like, this was just his first yes. race, so I, I don't want to read too much into it, but I am glad he's he's back on the track uh, and, and racing again. Another notable thing to come out of that race, Kayla Edwards, have to mention it, 432. That's pretty close to her indoor mile PR. So to you know be running that kind of time in January, um, you know, not an earth-shattering time, but a solid run from her, and I think that she's someone to just – continue to keep our eyes on as we start looking forward towards 
um, you know, outdoors and U.S. champs and worlds and things like that. Yeah, yeah. Um, listen, don't don't sleep on those women's performances from from UW. They were pretty solid. Uh, Julia Whitaker, yeah. right? Didn't she run like two hundred two? Um, I saw some Instagram posts. It's like, all right, cool. You just took the Stanford uh, school record indoor. It's like it was literally your first race. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, she's obviously been balling from from the high school level, uh, making all those sort of national national caliber meets. Uh, so to see her be pushed regularly uh, in, in the collegiate scene is going to be very very cool to see. Uh, hopefully, helps her refine a bit of the tactics necessary to excel in championship racing and because the 800 wasn't deep enough in, in America, uh, you know, to see her uh, get these reference frames is going to be cool. So to see her running 202 already, it's going to be going to be a spicy uh, outdoor season for sure. Yeah, super exciting. Other notable performances from uh, around the indoor track space, Hobbs Kessler 357 at the University of Michigan. I believe that's a flat 200. Mm hmm uh that might be i don't know if it's a flat 200 it's definitely a 200 meter track um so again really incredible per performance for him kicking off the season abby steiner 400 debut uh we could have probably done a whole segment on uh on that but she ran what 51 low like 51 two um yep so i mean super incredible run run there and then the other big notable performance to, to me, before I throw it over to you again, Skylar, Britton Wilson, new collegiate record at the 600 meters, so an off distance, which typically you don't value those as much, but it's an Afengmo record. Uh, so anytime you're taking down an Afengmo record, that's, uh, that's a pretty good look on the resume. Britton Wilson, a 400 hurdler uh, from mm -hmm. Arkansas. She'll be gearing up to to make to try and make a, a U.S. team for Worlds. I imagine uh, U.S. will have oh, yeah. four slots there, assuming Sydney wants to go run the open or the the four hundred hurdles. So, going to be awesome. What what other uh, notable performances do you have before we take a look at um, any kind of week two races to watch here? Um, I would just say uh, Britain did lose to Shamir Little in that same six hundred. So 400 meter Sh hurdlers getting Shamir nuts. Shamir Little is an incredible 400 hurdler. And it's good yeah. to see her like in top form, right? Like yes. that's exciting. So, so that stood out. Uh, and then the last thing for me was the, that meet at CU up in, up in Boulder, just like people getting after it, including uh, Sam Parsons running yep. four flat like 0.5 or like just missing the first sub four mile in Colorado state history. Uh, and then doubling back and like running a three K and a four by four. So yeah, uh, just, Hey, well, he's, and he's, he's trying to stay on that Germany national team. And Dion Sanders there in attendance. I don't know if you saw that on the uh, social sphere, but Dion I there, it. I respect that too, man. I respect that too. Love to see it. Yeah, there were a lot of pros at that meet, surprisingly. Like for, for it being so like lowly covered, every photo I saw, every result, I was like, oh, like there's like like I mean, there's so many training groups in Boulder, and they never get a chance to run on that track because CU has that thing on lockdown. They're like, oh, this is our one chance to see the inside. Let's go do it. Uh yeah, no, people people threw down this weekend and in, in CU. Yep. Love it. What uh what races are you most looking forward to on the indoor scene this week? I know that you'll be at us cross champs but uh what do you have your eye on in terms of uh the indoor the indoor scene i mean now begins the cycle of race <laughs> basically you're either running at bu or you're running in the armory and that's just what's going to happen for the next six weeks and so bu kicks it off this week um you know the the terrier invite is going to be absolutely insane a lot of folks going off distance going a little, little bit longer than they typically would or a little bit shorter um, because they're either getting ready for uh, the Grand Prix at New Balance uh, in Boston or they're getting ready for Valentine or they're getting ready for Milrose. But you got a lot of folks that are um, that are just getting ready to show up and show out that 5K. All right, let's talk about this 5K. Joe Klecker, Ollie Hoare, 
Beamish, McDonald. So the entire like OAC is running the 5K, only one of which is like a true 5K specialist. And I guess Morgan. So two, uh, two of four, like 5K specialists. But Ollie, going to be interesting. And then Joe, hey, let's just do some fun speed work. You got Morgan's Beetle Scum, Ben Flanagan. You got Mason Furlick. We just talked about Sam Parsons. He's there. Uh, you got uh, Adrian Wildshit from he's an NAZ Elite now, right? So, like, it's just going to be – there's so so much crossover that's going to be happening in this race um, that you know who knows who knows what any of this means. But hey, get 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 your standards early, get some points early, um, and and really start working on that grind towards world championships. So that's like the one race where I'm going to be definitely trying to tune in and uh, and see what happens on the men's side. Yeah, and so I think that that is not this weekend. I think that's the next weekend, and I think what? that that kicks off. So I think that that kicks off like this incredible slate of uh, of events. So you have Terrier Classic. There is another. There's the Battle in Beantown race this weekend at BU. Uh, That's the I one. Believe. Yep. Yep. And They're so then all, you've got you've got Terrier Classic. Then the next weekend you've got New Balance Indoor Grand yeah. Prix. Then the next weekend you have Melrose. Melrose. Games. <laughs> and then. <laughs> And then you go into the following weekend, uh, we'll have like MPSF indoor champs. You'll have a lot of like uh, collegiate stuff, like collegiate stuff. But then that weekend is world cross champs. Yep. And yeah. so it just, it get and then you've got the following weekend. Then you start to get to, um, to like your uh, like big indoor champs. So you've got like big East. Um, you've also got mixed in there, like world athletics indoor tour which we'll see how competitive some of that stuff will be. Um, and then you've got BU last chance qualifier, which you know is going to be solid. Always, always absurd. And so it's like this and, next you like, know, five these are just like, And that's just there, right? Like Dr. Sanders in there somewhere. Yep. Um, you have, there's got to be something in Albuquerque. Spire's always doing something. Like there's, there's going to be so many pop-up things that just occur. And then all of a sudden it's going to be March and you're either running indoors or you're running like sound running and we're already knocking out outdoor standards. So, and then, and then, and then it's April and it's the Boston marathon and all hell breaks loose. It's this, gonna be, this is gonna be a, you're not going to be, be awesome. awesome if, you're, if you're a running fan. So, and then moving on to topic five, our final topic here, any sort of remaining sponsor shakeups. I think the only one that we have seen come to fruition is Mark Scott, uh, leaving Bowerman Track Club to go to In In Running Team, mm -hmm. uh, which is uh, like a a more Euro based uh, athletics club. Uh, it sounds like his main reasoning was to join this team and go go train with teammates in Kenya. Um, any any thoughts on on Mark Scott leaving BTC? Uh, uh, this just broke this morning, so it's probably still pretty fresh for us. Yeah, I mean, we we obviously we'd seen the the exodus from from BTC, so so we had a little bit of time to process that. Given you come out of a world championship cycle, you're right into another world championship cycle, but there's always smoke around BTC, and you know, obviously the Shelby thing still looms large over the group. So, um, you know, we, that part of it. Okay, whatever. Like, not going to fault him for. But going to Kenya right now, always kind of a – it's touchy because, I mean, there have been a lot of athletes who have been banned coming out of Kenya uh, over the last four to six months especially. Like, somebody got popped for EPO, which – how do you get popped for EPO these days? Like, come on now. So I th – that part of it is going to – it's going to lend itself to speculation. Obviously, you know, as a group, they've had spectacular results. You've seen a lot of things happen on, on the marathon side. Obviously, you have Elliot Kipchoge, sort of like the, the poster child of the running team. But, you know, it's two things. One, how big can a sphere of influence get before the potency within that sphere sort of like loses its its magic, right? Um, so so there's that. And then two, it's just the optics of it all. And 
you know, if you can block all that out, great. Like we've seen some people do short term training stints, you know, in the Elbert Rift Valley or just elsewhere in Kenya and then come back fine. But it's right now of all times uh, to, to say that you're going to go work in Kenya. It just it's going it's a little to bring sketch. about extra spe- it's going to bring about extra speculation that you have to like mentally be ready to 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 endure. So it's hey, if it works out for them, great. But uh, but yeah, I think it's it's going to make for some some interesting fodder uh, on certain message boards for, to say the least. <laughs> yeah. I think that you summed up uh, basically all of my thoughts right there. I think that it's, I think for anyone to be going to Kenya to train currently, it's, it's a, a unique decision to make, I guess is, is the best way to put it. You know, I know that obviously not every athlete in Kenya or who travels to Kenya is doping, but the fact that there has been such a, a black cloud around uh, Kenyan athletics uh, as of right now, and I will give them, I guess, a little bit of a pat on the back. Some of the more recent doping violations have been reported by uh, like Athletics Kenya or like their governing body, which wasn't yeah. the case prior. Um, but yeah, I mean, interesting, uh, I think is probably the best word to way to put it. So excited obviously to see what he does but hopefully he can avoid uh any all of the uh kind of dark cloud that's just surrounding the region right now yep yeah i mean and also just not a group that's known for middle distance running um and and even some of that like 5k 10k has been a little uh touch and go so i'm just, i'll be interested to see how the progression goes for for him personally um but yeah it's it's gonna be it's gonna be fun to watch as we continue to to suss out doping violations and whereabouts violations and everything else. Um, and just you you want the sport to be on the on the up and up. So yeah, for sure. And so that's gonna do it for you know our weekly rundown here, kind of our main segment. We're gonna move into what I'm dubbing the inside lane, kind of our final wrap up segment here, where we kind of take a sneak peek behind the Aero Viper running road events. Um, right now, like I mentioned at the top of the show, Tucson Marathon registration is now open. If you're looking for, you know, a beautiful destination, uh, road marathon, half marathon, 50K, um, net downhill course, uh, beautiful, beautiful course. Go ahead and check that out. We'll make sure that we link of that in the description below. Uh, tucsonmarathon.com and then jackpot ultras which skylar and i had the uh privilege of being a part of the commentary team for last year that is now an era vipa owned event it is host to the usatf 100 mile road championships that'll be happening on march the 3rd um so yeah if you're interested in uh signing up either for the usatf road championships or any of the other distances uh, go ahead and visit aeroviperrunning.com, go to the jackpot page and check that out. Get to share the course with uh, some of the some of the country's best athletes, which is which is pretty awesome. And it's a good time just outside of Vegas in the beautiful town of Henderson, Nevada. Uh, and so, yeah, we don't have a whole lot of like inside information to report on either of those. We are excited, obviously, that jackpot is USATF 100 mile champs for 2023 again on the roads um and yeah like i said this uh this little segment will bring you any sort of inside information that we have but before we wrap up the show skylar i'll send it to you any sort of uh final thoughts for today's episode before we call it a show you know this is it's just an exciting time right we've got because you have road, cross, indoor. If you are a fan of the sport, it's uh, it's a great time to stay engaged. It's difficult to stay engaged because of how many different places to find all these uh, all these races between different streaming services and something's just not being covered. Um, but but I I implore everyone to to stay on top of the game. We're gonna do what we can uh, to keep you uh, in the know of some of the things that we at least find most important. But let's let's get the momentum going. It's not just about world championships and world majors. This is a, this is a great time uh, to lock in and be a fan. So uh, tell a friend, tell a friend, and we'll we'll uh, keep 
keep the ball rolling, baby. Yeah, I mean, just to piggyback on kind of your parting thoughts, I think that my parting message is pretty much the same. Like, what a time if you were new to following uh, the world of flat running, you know, marathoning, track and field, cross country. Like, what a time to be alive, man. We've got college athletes ripping fast miles in January. We've got, you know, the next two months Every single weekend, there's going to be something just incredible to follow along with from U.S. cross champs to Melrose to, you know, all the way up to the outdoor season and Boston Marathon. And like, it's just a, a an awesome time to be a fan of the sport. And uh, like Skylar said, I think that we're both just super excited to to be able to share kind of our thoughts uh, as we follow along on this crazy journey known as uh, track and field. So. I believe that is going to do it for today's show. Uh, thank you all for tuning in. We will send it to the outro screen in just a second, but make sure you give it a thumbs up. Make sure you subscribe to the channel. Make sure you share it with your friends. Do it all. Uh, and let us know in the comments, like, you know, if we messed anything up, let us know in the comments below. Uh, maybe we'll start pulling those uh, into the into the show as well. Uh, but yeah, let us know any other uh, things that you're excited for uh, in the uh, in the run flat space. So that's going to do it for this week's episode. I'm Matt Feldick, my esteemed colleague, Skylar Hall. Y'all have a great rest of your week.